All right, folks, welcome. We're here today at the Ira Brilliant Beethoven Center at San Jose State Library. And uh, we're talking with Patricia. Patricia, can you tell us uh, who you are? Tell us, uh, introduce yourself, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Patricia Stroh, and I'm the curator at the Beethoven Center and also currently the interim director. Fantastic. How long have you been here, Patricia? I've been here for almost 31 years. 31 years. And what brought you to the center in the first place? Well, it was just very much a lucky situation. I had just finished school and this job came up. It was a, a new position, new library. They were looking for a curator and it was in the Bay Area. So I just snapped it up because I just love Beethoven. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me. And obviously, I love the job because I've been here for a long time. I would hope so. <laughs> it certainly makes 31 years fly by a little faster. It sure does. That's fantastic. Well, so do you, what got uh, Mr. Billiant started collecting all these amazing things? Because looking around from the sculptures to the original works, the instruments, there's so much amazing work here. What got him started? He started out because he discovered Beethoven's music. I mean, he wasn't a musician himself, but he started to listen to the music. It was a period of his time when, when he was rather ill and he was in the hospital or just sick at home and he was listening to music all the time and he, that's how he discovered Beethoven and he just became totally hooked and became a huge fan and decided, well, you know, I'm kind of interested in, in collecting. He was like collecting stamps. And <laughs> okay. Like that. He said, you know, I'd, li I'd really like to own something of, that Beethoven actually wrote on himself. So he started looking for original manuscript letters of Beethoven that might still be available through the antiquarian market or through auctions. And he started buying those, but after a while he realized that they were pretty expensive, so he wasn't going to be able to continue that for a long time. So he, then he switched over to purchasing the first editions of the music. So these are very special too because they're the very, very first printings of the music, and that's one of the ways Beethoven made his living was to sell his work to publishers, who would then print them for people to buy. So. Um, uh, Mr. Brilliant started buying those, and after he had a collection of 80 or so, he decided he didn't want them just to sit in his home, you know, gathering dust. He wanted to share them with people and discovered there wasn't really a Beethoven collection anywhere in the United States wow. yet. So he, uh, he did some looking around, and they ended up here because he had a connections through a friend who was on the faculty of the university at that time, who, who then, on his behalf, approached the administration at San Jose and said, I have this private collector who has this amazing Beethoven collection. Where should it go? And they said, we'll take it. <laughs> so that, that's how it came about. He, um, he met these administrators, the president and the dean of the college, and they all got together and made this plan to bring his collection here. Sure. Well, yeah, what a neat collection, too, because, I mean, from, from the busts and the original works, I mean, he's got a couple thousand pieces here. Do you think he might have gone a little overboard? <laughs> well, no, because he was very focused on the original letters that he was able to buy and the first editions. And after we opened the Beethoven Center, then we started building the collection around that. So Mr. Brilliant still acquired first editions for us, but then it was uh, us working here in the Beethoven Center that started building the other collections. So we got the books and started getting the artworks and, and the musical instruments. Fantastic. And here at the Brilliant Center, you guys have the largest collection of first editions in the United States or in North America, is that yes. right? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, and you guys have uh, first editions of, uh, or at least uh, pieces, if not the whole thing, of each one of his nine symphonies, too. We have the, all the nine symphonies, we have most of the piano sonatas, the string quartets, and many, many other works. That's amazing. And I heard that, uh, I, I don't know if this is true, uh, apparently there's a lot of funny rumors surrounding Beethoven, but I heard that he wouldn't play a lot of his pieces because he wanted to sell the, the manuscripts. Is, do you have any idea if that's true? No, I mean, he really wanted to play his music. Sure. You know, so yeah, one of the things about him was that he was an amazing um, keyboard player, okay. um, pianist. And so when he first went to Vienna, he did a lot of concertizing there to get his music out to people. Sure. So uh, one of the ways he made a living, actually, was to do concerts as well. So yeah, he wanted his music to be heard. He just didn't want to 
share his manuscripts, you know, sure. you know like copied. Oh, you know, okay. So that way, so. And not only so do you guys have these manuscripts, but some of them have some pretty interesting things. I heard there's a couple different mistakes and printing errors in some of these, right? A lot of them have printing errors. It's <laughs> a very common thing during his time. And unfortunately, Beethoven himself was not a good proofreader, as I'm sure a lot of us can confess to as well. I mean, when we, the music is really familiar to you, when you're looking through the proof of, a, of an edition, you don't see mistakes sometimes, so he missed sure. a lot of them. So yeah, it's kind of interesting to to see these early editions and then read his letters where he complains to the publisher about <laughs> all the errors and then you realize, well, yeah, they made mistakes, but part of that is your fault because you didn't catch them. You didn't proofread. And then sometimes he wanted to make changes in the music after it had already been printed. Wow. A real whole process in getting the music out. Sure. So if we played a piece with corrections and a piece without, do you think you would be able to tell the difference? Most people probably wouldn't. Yeah. Although some of them are pretty glaring errors. Really? I don't know if you know, know enough about music, but sometimes um, they would leave out the clef signs. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't know what clef you're reading in, then you're obviously going to be way off. Sure. Anyway. So if somebody sat down at the piano and tried to play from some of these first editions, really following exactly what's on the score, then it's going to sound a little strange in some cases. Oh, wow, how funny. So Patricia, can you play? I do, yeah. Oh, so if we're going to look at a harpsichord or a clavichord or a pianoforte, do you have a preference? Well, of course, I prefer the forte pianos. Um, um, but, you know, harpsichords and clavichords are wonderful instruments, too, in their own way. They all have their weaknesses and strengths. Sure. But the forte piano is really the instrument where you could be a very expressive player. You can play with a lot of different tone quality, and you can play with different dynamic levels. And, and then they have the pedals that add color effects right. as well. So it's a lot more variety you can get out of a forte piano sure. compared to the harpsichord or clavichord. I never even knew a clavichord existed until I started doing research on this, but it's pretty neat to actually see and to play and hear such a difference in, in tone and sound, and it's, it's really neat, neat to see that. Yeah. Um, well, can you tell me about the piece we have behind us? This is not something you see pretty often in a museum. Yeah, well, this is a reproduction of Beethoven's life mask. Sure. There was an artist who was commissioned to have a bust of Beethoven made for an art museum in Vienna. And so, you know, at this time in his life, Beethoven was in his early 40s. He was quite famous in sure. Vienna, so people wanted to depict him in art. So Beethoven did agree to sit for this artist, who then put this gooey plaster mold on his face. And so the idea was that they, that would then be a mold that can be used to cast uh, a bust. Uh, but Beethoven didn't really like that experience too well. You can imagine he was impatient with it, it was uncomfortable, so he, he tore it off his face before it really got a chance to set, and it did crack down the middle, but the um, artist was able to put it together and uh, from that make the bust. So this is just a reproduction of that life mask, and we put it on this post so you could see about how tall he was. So many of our visitors come here, especially the youngsters come in here and measure themselves up to Beethoven and of course you know some of these young people are quite a bit taller Tower than over. Already, so people didn't grow to be quite as tall at that time uh, compared to today. I mean Beethoven wasn't really considered short yeah. in his time he was this sort of average average height and he was kind of a stocky person clumsy and with the way he walked so but the, this way you really get to get a sense of what he looked like. I like that. I mean, with the whole museum, with such a, a variety of co of the collection, you get such a amazing view of his life. You know, I mean, some of the things are from the period and are, are drawings and images of the period. Do you have a favorite piece here, Patricia? Um, well, I do, but it's not actually out <gasps> right now, so I can't show it to you. But we have some wonderful portraits. There's a portrait that was done by an artist named Huffel. Uh, this was also when Beethoven was in his early 40s, and it's it's kind of a romanticized depiction of him, but he really liked it. We know mm -hmm. that he did because he, 
he um, had copies that he gave to some of his friends. So that's, that's fantastic. Okay, so Patricia, so I have to ask you, you guys have two, um, two of your older works that were actually written by Beethoven, and one of them, I believe, is called Description of a Girl. Now, that's not the German, that's not the original right, German, yes. but they talk about a young woman in there. Who is this young woman? We don't know. I mean, it's just poetry that he was writing, of this name, and whether there was a young girl he knew when he was young. I mean, he wrote this when he was still, you know, quite a child himself. How, how old? <sighs> I don't, I think maybe this goes back to when he was 12 or 13. Wow. So, I mean, it was his, one of his first explorations of composing, and, you, and a lot of times you compose songs because you can have a melody and then just a simple piano accompaniment. So that's what it was. But I know the word, the name Elise means something to people who have studied Beethoven because of his famous piano piece that we call for Elise. Oh. Um, but um, that adds a story behind it, too, because for a long time people couldn't really know why he called it for Elise, because they couldn't really track who Elise was in his life. And then later it was suggested that, well, it wasn't really Elise he was writing to, it was a woman named Teresa. Hmm. So the piece should really should be called for Teresa. <laughs> Or it's not going to change. <laughs> not going to change. One of the things that I like about um, that uh, earlier song uh, description about a girl is he says uh, he's describing Elise to a friend of his, and he says this line where he says, "Your eyes shine like stars in the winter," and I guess it's a very romantic thing to sing about. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Patricia, thank you so much for inviting us here. And I, I have to ask before we go, could you play us something short on one of these wonderful instruments? We've got such a collection. You said Bill's favorite was Alley Cat. <laughs> we won't do Alley Cat. We won't do Alley Cat? <laughs> That's not Beethoven. But I can play a little bit. Yeah, I can play. Oh, I would love to. Please pick your favorite.